Hi there. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Doug Picklick. I'm the editor of HPAC Magazine, and this is 30 Mechanical Minutes, virtual content for real-time professionals. Today I'm having a conversation with uh, a true expert in the hydronics field and someone I'm proud to say has been a regular contributor to HPAC Magazine for a very long time. Mr. John Siegenthaler. Hi, John. Hi, Doug. Glad to be here. Great to have you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor for today's session, and that is AirMac, uh, manufacturers of air to water heat pumps for residential and commercial applications, distributed across North America by MITS Air Conditioning. Thank you, AirMac, for your support. So, John, I'm happy to have you here. We're gonna be talking air to water heat pumps for residential applications. Um, and these are products you've been writing about in the magazine for many years now. Um, I mean, with this push towards decarbonization and electrification, I know air to water heat pumps seems to be the next logical step for uh, hydronics professionals. It, but, it is, and, and air to water is definitely gonna be a growing market uh, across North America. It's a very large market globally, about 4 million of these a year uh, in the traditional hydronics markets um, in Europe and also in Asia, so. Okay, uh, well, I, I feel there's still a lot to learn about these products, um, including what's even out there on the market uh, here in North America. So to begin, um, I'm hoping you can just give us the basics on how air to water heat pumps work. And then I've also heard there's two different styles, the monoblock and split systems. So I'm hoping you can explain that too. Yeah, let's go right into the next slide here. Um, okay, let's, whoops. Yeah, so um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with air to air heat pumps, uh, especially ductless mini splits, uh, where the source of low temperature heat is outside air. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, water to water heat pumps, uh, typically used with geothermal earth loops. And uh, the, geother the heat absorbed from the geothermal loop uh, is raised in temperature and then sent off through a hydronic system. So what we're doing with an air to water heat pump is we're, we're borrowing the air side, in, if you will, from a ductless mini split, we're, we're absorbing heat from outside air and we're distributing that heat through the building using a hydronic distribution system. So hence the name air to water. Uh, and in cooling mode, we're chilling water that is going to be used to cool the building and then the heat pump is rejecting that outside. So there's definitely an overlap here between traditional air to air heat pumps and water to water heat pumps. Um, let's go right to the next slide, Doug. Yep. Uh, and Doug was mentioning there are a couple different, I'll call them flavors of air to water heat pumps. There's what's called a monoblock heat pump. And that, that term, I believe, is a, is a European designation. What it means, it's a self-contained unit. It is factory charged with refrigerant. The installer is going to set that on some type of a, a pad or a mounting frame. They're going to connect two water pipes to it and an electrical harness, uh, but they're Typically, there is no need to adjust the refrigerant charge in it. So it's a self-contained unit. You can see several manufacturers offer them. Um, if you're familiar with central air conditioner, you have an outdoor unit. This is very similar. It might be a little bit larger depending on the capacity, uh, but typically it sits outside on a some type of a frame. You want to make sure it's up above snow level. And... Uh, you can see the fans that blow the air across the uh, evaporator coil. And uh, it's a little harder to see it on some of the units. You can actually see some of the piping connections that lead inside. So uh, again, a monoblock is a self-contained factory charge unit. This will probably be the dominant configuration, at least initially as air to water heat pumps gain market share in North America. John, and this one is the connection into the house. Is there refrigerant flowing into the house or is it the actual heated water? 
It's, it's actually a mixture of water and antifreeze, Doug. Um, typically in cold climates, most manufacturers are going to insist on using antifreeze. And for good reason, if there is a prolonged power outage and it's below freezing, if you have water in an outdoor unit, it could freeze and damage the unit. So typically it is a, a mixture of, in upstate New York, we use typically a 30% solution of propylene glycol antifreeze and water but no refrigerant passes between the outdoor unit and any, anything else. Yeah, and the other configuration is a split system. And this, this is similar to what you'd have with a central air conditioning system or even a ductless mini split. You have an outdoor unit, you have an indoor unit. These are connected with refrigerant tubing. So the refrigerant is flowing from the outdoor unit through the indoor unit, transferring heat to water. And you can see in the graphic in the lower right there, that water then goes out to the balance of the system. Uh, so the installation of this type of a system would require some basic refrigeration tools and skills, uh, knowing how to connect the line set, how to do a pressure test, how to pull a vacuum. And once the line set is verified, uh, typically, the manufacturers provide enough refrigerant in the outdoor unit so that when you open the service valves, that refrigerant just flows to the indoor unit and you're ready to go. Uh, but this does require some basic refrigeration tools and, and skills to put it together. Okay. Now, I, I think people need to know how many of these brands or products are there even on the market in North America? Because it's something we... There's, you don't see a lot. Well, here we go. Yeah, so that the market is definitely established and it's growing. So over there on the left, those are the currently available products, at least to my knowledge. And, and th these are a mixture of products coming out of Asia that are private labeled. Some are made in North America, some are made in Canada. The, the ones in red there are three Canadian brands. Uh, they vary between monoblock configurations and split system configurations. Uh, but I, I do want to stress there is product availability. This is not something we're waiting for. If you want to go out and do one of these systems tomorrow, you have several uh, brands. And within each brand, you've got different capacity ranges to choose from. And over on the right, these are anticipated products. These are all companies, uh, again, either out of the Asian market or European market that have these products in those markets and are watching the North American market. And my estimate would be within the next couple of years, you're, you're going to see more companies getting into the air to water heat pump market uh, with offerings in North America. And, and some of the brand names that we might be more familiar with from the traditional boiler market or even the air to air, to air heat pump market? That's right. And actually one more anticipated product, Wiesman. I'm sure most people that have done hydronics have, have heard of Wiesman. Uh, Wiesman has had these products in, in global markets and uh, likely will have them over here in the near future. Okay. Um, all right. And so I know, what about heat production? I know that hydronics pros are concerned about the ability of heat pumps to heat a home like a gas fired boiler can. Yeah. You tell us well, there. Yeah. Um, the key concept here is as it gets colder outside, any air source heat pump decreases in its heating output. So the BTUs per, per hour that you're getting goes down. You can see on the graph on the left there, as the outdoor temperature goes down, the heating capacity goes down. And that heating capacity is also a function of the water temperature we are requiring the machine to operate at. The lower the water temperature, the higher the heating capacity. And then over on the right, coefficient of performance. This is it's a ratio of the heat output divided by the, the uh, power input to the heat pump. It's the same story. As it gets colder, the coefficient of performance goes down. And as the water temperature that the unit is operating at increases, the COP actually goes down. So the takeaway from this, the best performance is going to be with low temperature hydronic distribution systems like radiant slabs, uh, panel radiators, uh, fan coils that can be sized for temperatures of uh, 
120 degrees Fahrenheit or less are tip. That's a typical guideline. Okay. So yeah, you're talking. Uh... <clears throat> yeah. And we, we can see here, Doug, here's uh, just those uh, yellow bars on the bar graph just represent typical ranges of water temperature for different heat emitters. And over on the left uh, in the purple, I've kind of drawn a line at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Several types of radiant panels, uh, floor heating, wall heating, ceiling heating, as well as panel radiators. Um, we've actually got a job now that was just done last winter with panel radiators uh, that are supplied from an air to water heat pump. And we're able to heat the house with 90 degree Fahrenheit water. And it's because the panel radiator's been sized for those low water temperatures. Um, and I do wanna say, don't give up on air to water heat pumps, even if you have a baseboard system, you will get partial output. And quite honestly, in, in many climates, you can get three quarters or more of the seasonal heating energy from the heat pump, even with a typical baseboard system that under design load might need 170, 180 degrees Fahrenheit water. Okay. So what you're showing here though, the, the best solution seems to be the, the in-floor system or something with a large mass of water, right? That's well, a large, uh, yeah, large surface area. Uh, slab on grade can work well. Uh, as with any heat source, uh, the, the resistance of the finished flooring, the tube spacing, the underside insulation, they all have a, a bearing on performance. But uh, a four inch concrete slab with tubing maybe 12 inches on center with a low resistance covering, well within the range of what an air to water heat pump can do. Um, so uh, definitely. It, and it, quite honestly, Doug, it's the same story with ModCon boilers. So the lower the water temperature, the better performance. Here's an example of radiant ceilings. I, I know these are not as common as radiant floors, but I would urge people to look at these. Uh, they, they can be real problem solvers where you're going to have uh, high floor resistance uh, coverings. If somebody wants a thick pad and carpet, kind of rules out floor heating. But radiant ceilings can work very well. There's a, a formula there that will let you get an estimate of what the output of the radiant ceiling construction has shown. Uh, that, that tubing is eight inches on center. It's using six inch wide aluminum plates. And it actually performs quite well. Uh, you can get a, at, at 110 degree average water temperature, we can get about uh, 28 BTUs per hour per square foot. And this is something that's also low mass. It, it, it comes up to temperature quickly and it's adaptable to radiant cooling down the road. Uh, right. So radiant ceilings uh, are a very good option with um, air to water heat pumps. And yeah, here's radiant uh, walls. Now this is exactly the same construction, just turned 90 degrees. So you see the aluminum plates, the, the, the tubing eight inches on center. Uh, in the lower left there, there's that knee wall. Uh, after the drywall has been installed, there's no indication of any heating presence other than the wall gets gently warm. And then over in the lower right, that's a stairwell uh, wall. And that actually has uh, this construction embedded into it. So you can, you can actually get pretty creative with radiant walls and uh, integrate them in places that are you know, not obvious. You, you really don't see them. Again, the output, it's actually a little higher output than a radiant ceiling because you get a little bit better convection on a vertical surface. Okay. And, and you, you mentioned that panel reds are an option? Absolutely. So here's a typical uh, panel radiator. Uh, again, there's several brands available now in North America. Uh, they they uh, can be sized around relatively low water temperatures. I would say anywhere from 100 to maybe 120 degrees at design load. Uh, they can be equipped with thermostatic radiator valves. So you have room by room zoning. It, no batteries, no wires, no apps, just a, a very simple little knob. You turn it uh, till, you know, till you have a, a comfort level that you want. And down at the bottom, that just shows over a period of four minutes how quickly these panels respond. So they warm up quickly, which, which is important 
And just as importantly, they cool down quickly when you turn the, the water flow off. So we don't get into a, uh, a situation where we're overshooting in temperature. So I, I think as houses get tighter, it's actually one of my favorite heat emitters, um, low, low thermal mass panel radiators tied in with heat pumps. Yep, I know you've written about that, certainly in uh, the pages of HPAC. We have. Yeah. And now, of course, there's a lot of talk. I mean, certainly here in Canada, uh, the idea of the heat pump water heater or air to, air to water heat pumps and, and the, uh, I guess what they call that cutoff temperature, right? Um, just, and people, so, so there's a lot of talk about keeping your boiler and having, a, I guess what they're calling a, a dual fuel system. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, dual fuel is has a number of really good points to it, especially if it's a retrofit. If you're going into a, a house or commercial building for that matter, it has a boiler. Let's assume the boiler has some life left in it. Uh, don't tear it out. Use it as the backup and the supplemental heater. So uh, let's say it's a baseboard system and it needs 180 degree water at design load. Well, you're only at design load maybe 3% of the time or sometimes less than 3% of the you know, duration of a winter. So uh, we've done modeling in, in upstate New York, relatively cold climates, uh, 7,000, even 8,000 degree day climates. And we're, we're seeing 85, sometimes even 90% of the energy, the space heating energy that the building needs can be contributed by the air to water heat pump and then that existing boiler, or if it's new construction, uh, it could be a new boiler, uh, does the balance. Uh, one of the nice things about a boiler, a fossil fuel boiler, you can run it on a very small generator. So in the, in the uh, occasion where you have a power outage, it is possible to run a heat pump on a, on a backup generator, but it, it has to be a fairly large generator probably minimum 5,000 watt generator on an average house. Whereas a boiler, the burner on a, uh, an oil burner, for example, that only needs about 400 watts of power uh, and the circulators are low power. So with a relatively small portable generator, you could keep the heat on in, in the building using the boiler. And the other nice thing about dual fuel, it sets up scenarios that are favorable to both um, electric utilities as well as customers. Uh, think about off-peak rates where the heat pump could operate on the lowest cost electricity and then perhaps the fossil fuel boiler could operate on that when uh, electricity is at peak price. Oh, and yeah. I, I think that opens up a lot of possibilities in the future um, with uh, you know coordination with these uh, real-time rates and off-peak rates from electric utilities. That's a real controls issue, right? But that's becoming much more common, much more available. Easy to do, yeah. If the utility just, typically there's a, a little relay contact in a meter and that relay contact closes when you have off-peak rates available and you, the balance of the system responds to that. Uh, and, and going forward, I, I think you'll see more research into kind of what's the optimal combination of heat pumps and boilers uh, but I do want to stress, uh, you know, fossil fuel boilers still have a place in our economy. And I, I know, you know, electrification is a very strong uh, buzz topic right now. But there are some definite benefits to a concept like this, where we're relying on the air to water heat pump for the majority of our space heating energy. But we're still keeping that fossil fuel boiler in there for the reasons we talked about. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was, uh, I think we had, yeah, just this one more here, talking about uh, baseboards still. Yeah, and you know, what this is, if you look at that graph in the lower right, that's bin temperature data for Syracuse, upstate New York. And yeah, it can get cold in Syracuse, uh, possibly even down to minus 20, but it's extremely rare. And if it happens, it might be minus 20 for an hour out of the winter. And I want you to look within that red rectangle is roughly between 10 degrees Fahrenheit and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where the majority of the hours in a, a typical winter, in, at least in Syracuse, 
uh, occur. And those are all within the operating range of an air to water heat pump. So using concepts like outdoor reset control, where we reduce the water temperature under partial load, that allows that heat pump to operate at good efficiency. Uh, my suggestion is design your distribution systems or perhaps modify an existing system so that it can provide design load output at 120 degree water temperature or, or lower. Now, if you can't do that, all it means is that the heat pump's gonna contribute less of the total seasonal energy. But as I say, we've done modeling in cold climates and we're seeing upwards of 75% of that total seasonal space heating energy coming from the heat pump, even in a cold climate and even with a unmodified typical residential baseboard system. Okay. And, you know, I had a question for you. It had to do with, do you always need a buffer tank when setting up a hydronic system with an air to water heat pump? Um, uh, not always. Um, now, typically if it's an on off heat pump, if it's not a variable speed compressor, and especially if you're doing a lot of zoning on the hydronic distribution system, uh, you're gonna want a buffer tank in there. Otherwise you will end up potentially short cycling the heat pump. Now, a couple of things are changing here. Uh, with inverter compressors, variable speed compressors that just like with a ModCon boiler, the heat pump can reduce its output substantially in, in trying to better match the load. In some cases that will eliminate the need for a buffer tank. And one of, the, one of the best applications is actually light commercial slab on grade buildings. Uh, think about a, a minus muffler shop, for example, or an auto service garage, or maybe a welding shop where you're gonna have floor heating and you have perhaps just one or two zones. All that you would need would be a hydraulic separator between the heat pump and the slab. There would be no need for a buffer tank. So buffer tanks are kind of a traditional design approach, especially with on-off heat pumps, but as variable speed compressor technology moves forward, they'll become less and less of a absolute requirement in, in many systems. Okay. Well, now this is a 30 minute session. We're just trying to provide an overview for all of our uh, viewers. Um, and of course, uh, something that, that I'm aware of is that the introduction of heat pumps and you mentioned this, it does open up the potential for not only heating, but also cooling, uh, heating domestic hot water, and also preheating ventilation air. And I know all of this because you wrote about it in the latest issue of HPAC in our August issue, our modern hydronic section. So I'm going to save you talking about it right now because people can read about it in our August issue. Yeah, yeah. And, and a, a real quick summary, uh, my take is, one contractor provides all the HVAC needs, space heating, cooling, domestic hot water, and heat recovery ventilation. Single source responsibility, it's good for the consumer, and it's good, it's, it's more profit potential for the installer as well. Perfect. Okay, we've got a lot of questions, so I think it's time for us to get to those. So I am going to uh, start reading out what we got here. Uh, Tom asks, how hot can a heat pump go? Right now, my electric slash wood boiler is set at 75 C. Oh, 75 C. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying so to remember that. what that is. Is that about 140? No, that's, I, I can't do the conversion in my head. Um, but to answer your question, if you talk to the manufacturers, uh, some of them will say their machines can actually go up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. However, remember the graph about heating capacity and COP. It's not always about how high you can get the water temperature. It's, sometimes it's about the efficiency as well as the output in BTUs per hour. I would suggest to you that 120 is a very doable upper temperature limit. 130, most machines will do 130, but the COPs are going to suffer when you do that. Instead of COPs that are two plus, you're probably going to be in the range of a 1.5, 1.4, something like that. It's still better than electric resistance heat, but 
I, I would say you're not optimizing the use of the heat pump to push them to their, you know, to what their limit is. And it also strains the compressor more. So safe number, 120 degrees Fahrenheit would be fine. Okay, I have to thank Robin out there who let us know that 75C equals 167 Fahrenheit. Ah, there we that's go. That's a pretty yeah. high, that's a pretty yeah. high temperature. Yeah, okay. no, I, uh, short of uh, COP or, um, CO2 heat pumps can actually reach that. Uh, and you're seeing some CO2 heat pumps in commercial domestic water heating applications. Uh, I'm only aware of one company that has a CO2 based space heating heat pump and it's not widely marketed at this point in North America. Most of these machines are currently on a 410A refrigerant. That is also gonna change. You're gonna see machines going to R32 and also to um, propane. Uh, I forget the number on propane, but uh, we're, we're seeing more, uh, I'll say global friendly refrigerants coming into the market. It's already happening uh, to a large extent in Europe and the, the timeline in North America, uh, 410A, I believe, is already at the beginning of a phase out period. Yeah, I think so. Okay, uh, Robin asks John often suggests piping buffer tanks in three pipe configuration. During defrost mode, the heat pump extracts heat from the buffer tank. Would three pipe not result in heat emitters receiving cold water? No, not really. Um, the mass of the tank, at least it hasn't been my experience, uh, that the mass of the tank can handle that. Uh, remember, that defrost cycle is relatively short, too, on the order of maybe four minutes, five minutes. Um, and uh, again, my experience has been with slab type floor heating where you've got you know, a lot of mass and no, you have no idea that the heat pump is actually in a defrost mode. Yeah. So, yeah, it's going to take some heat out of the buffer tank, but it's a short duration and typically the thermal mass of the balance of system, uh, in a sense, masks that effect. Okay. Okay, we do actually, some, some people have asked about the CO2, uh, mentioned that it's gaining traction. Um, should we care about keeping dis just distribution to under 120? Um, when you're talking about CO2, because as you just mentioned, it does have the ability to take the, the temperature up a little higher. Yeah, um, at least in theory, the CO2 yeah. heat pumps can operate at those high temperatures with minimal effect on COP. Uh, the, the issue, and it, I'll, I'll share it simply as my opinion right now. The, the concern that I have is, are there service techs that can handle potential issues with CO2 based heat pumps. Um, all yeah. the ones that I'm familiar with are factory charged, but down the line, if there is a service issue and make sure that somebody's available that can do the service. And in my area right now, honestly, I'm not sure who I go to to have that done. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. <clears throat> okay. Um, someone asks, uh, Todd, what are the advantages or disadvantages of having separate buffer tanks for cooling and heating versus mm -hmm. using one? It's a good question. Um, where two buffer tanks are good, relatively large buildings where you want simultaneous heating and cooling. Um, if you don't need simultaneous heating and cooling, you can probably get away with one buffer tank. Now, one possible exception I know in Western Canada, and this is true in Western US, um, <clears throat> the Chinook winds, I believe is the name of it, where it can be quite mm -hmm. cold in the morning. So the building needs heating, but by afternoon, the building actually needs cooling. In a situation like that, possibly two buffer tanks, but in the Northeast, typically we leave the heating season in my area mid to late April. And we really don't need cooling until well into June. So there's, there's really no need to have that simultaneous availability of space heating water and cooling water. Now, <clears throat> in a commercial building, maybe you have uh, internal heat gains or core areas in a building where you have a 12 month per year cooling load. In a situation like that, it would make sense to have two buffer tanks. 
uh, you can set up multiple air to water heat pumps and you can direct their output to either the hot tank or the cold tank. Another thing that can be done with two buffer tanks like that is to put a water to water heat pump between the two buffer tanks. It chills one tank, the cold tank, and it dumps the heat into the hot tank. So you actually get incredibly high COPs because both the cooling effect the heat pump is creating and the heating effect are both useful in the building. So, you know, uh, in a typical residential system, really don't need two buffer tanks. Okay. Okay, we, we've reached the half hour mark, but I think if you're okay, John, we're just gonna keep plowing through. We've got a few more questions here. Sure. Um, you know, so people are have, have asked about cooling. Would air to water heat pumps work efficiently in providing cooling, i.e. chilled water to cooling coils? The answer? Absolutely. Yeah. They can produce 40 degree water if you want it. Um, typically it suggests designing around 50 degree chill water temperature, you get a little better performance out of the heat pump. Remember that as the chill water temperature requirement goes down, so does the cooling capacity and the, and the EER, uh, which is in effect the cooling COP of the heat pump. So 50, 45 to 50 degree chill fluid, it really doesn't matter where it comes from. That's uh, very useful in cooling coils. Uh, it can provide good dehumidification and, and good sensible cooling as well. So yeah, yeah, air to water is excellent for cooling. Someone asks, are these heat pumps available in variable load setting? I think you mentioned that, these inverter. You see more and more the manufacturers that have had models or some of them currently have models with fixed speed compressors they're moving towards inverter-based compressors because it just allows the output of the heat pump in both heating and cooling mode to better match what the load is. And you actually get a higher effective COP when you're operating a, a variable speed compressor at a reduced speed. You have a, a smaller BTU per hour heat transfer across the same heat exchanger area. So you actually improve the efficiency of the heat pump a bit. Okay, we have a few questions and comments, but here's another one. Um, how do you prevent high boiler temps coming back to the heat pump? Well, there's a number of ways to do it. Uh, typically the heat pump, if you're operating a boiler at a high temperature like that, the heat pump would be shut off. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, from a plumbing standpoint, uh, the slide that we had up there, essentially you're gonna put the heat pump in parallel with the boiler. Uh, put a circulator on each, put a check valve in each, and your controls are going to determine, you know, whether the two can operate simultaneously. Um, you could operate them simultaneously, and the way you would protect against high temperatures would be to have some kind of a temperature limiting controller that once that return temperature gets above a certain setting, it simply locks out the heat pump. And that, you know, relatively simple thing to do. Okay. Uh, someone, uh, Jean-Marc, is, is asking how efficient is the air to water heat pump when outside temperatures are around minus 12 C, which, um, again, I don't have my converter with me here, John. Yeah. Um, again, well, it's you know, it suffers, right? Yeah. If you go back and look, all the manufacturers publish the heating capacity as a function of outside temperature as well as COP as a function of outside temperature. So, I would tell you, let's see, minus 12 C, you're probably still seeing uh, COPs of 2.0, maybe a little bit higher on most machines today. So, you know, two to maybe 2.1, 2.2 COPs um, at those temperatures. And again, it's, it's not just what the outdoor temperature is, it's what are you asking the heat pump to produce? If you're asking it for 130 degree water at minus 12 C outside, you're probably less than a 2.0 COP. If you're asking it for 95 degree water when it's minus 12 C outside, you're probably 2.2, maybe even 2.3 on COP. Okay. Um, someone is asking, is cooling effective through baseboards? No, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, yeah. If you pump chill fluid through baseboard and that fluid gets below the dew the dew point of the room, you're going to start creating condensation. 
And baseboards are just not designed for that. If you're going to do chill water cooling, there's basically a couple approaches. You can use an air handler that has a drip pan in it for a, like a single zone or in a big house, you could use multiple ducted air handlers, all equipped with uh, um, drip pans. And there are other units. You can get high wall console units. You can get wall uh, consoles. You can get um, cabinet units. They all, the, the key is they all have to have a means of collecting and draining away condensation because, you know, on a humid day, you could have a dew point 65, maybe even 70 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas your chill water temperature is 45 or 50. You're well below dew point. Anything that water, chill water goes through is going to have potential for condensation. And I'll take the, the opportunity. You can't mess around with insulation on a chill water cooling system. You've got to insulate everything. You've got to glue the joints. You cannot let that air that surrounds those components get to the, the pipe or to the components. If you do, you will have condensation. So you have to do a good job with your insulation. Typically in, in smaller systems, it's going to be an elastomeric foam um, that you, know, you can cut, fit, and glue. Some components today are starting to come with uh, insulation shells. The, the key concept is if air can get to the surface it's, and the surface is below the dew point, you will get condensation. So you've got to seal the joints, make sure everything is buttoned up nice and tight. Okay. I'm just going to, I, 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 there's, a, there's a, a lot of activity in the chat section, and I'm just going to share a little bit of this because some of this is commentary. There's a few questions in here too, but uh, I'm just going to let it rip. Um, David, uh, let us know that Stiebel Eltron units are in stock in Seattle and Boston and available today. So great. Both of those uh, places are not in Canada. So hopefully uh, uh, they'll be coming to Canada soon. Uh, Corey mentions that he spoke to his LG rep and um, they've got some monoblock heat pump is about eight to 12 months away from being off in North America. So Great to hear. Um, Hydro Solar in Quebec uh, carries a white labeled unit, apparently. Someone had asked how popular radiant ceilings or walls are in Canada. I don't know if we can answer that. I don't, I, I don't really know, but you know what? Uh, let's make them popular. I don't know. They sound like a well, good idea to me. Yeah, you know, I, I often talk about keeping uh, install details like radiant ceilings, radiant walls, they should be part of your portfolio. Um, you don't have to install all radiant ceilings or all radiant floors or all radiant walls, but walking into a project and discussing what are the needs and taking a look, you know, if somebody's got shag carpet, although I'm dating myself with shag carpet there <laughs> and a thick foam pad, don't do floor heating, but that doesn't mean walk away from the project. Radiant ceilings, radiant walls. We've done walk-in showers with radiant walls with ceramic tile. Uh, we've done radiant walls under breakfast bars where the stools would go. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get really creative with, with radiant walls. And we've got radiant ceilings operating on, uh, well, actually operating on geothermal heat pumps, but same thing, it's, it's a warm water hydronic distribution system. So. I, I just tell people, you know, keep your, you know, keep your options open and have a solution when floor heating isn't necessarily going to work out. Yeah. Okay. We also have a note here that Epi Queen have an air to water heat pump in Quebec. So there we go. When a heat pump goes into defrost cycle, does that lower the temperature of the supply water? Uh, well, when a heat pump goes into defrost, basically it's going into cooling. So we're taking heat from inside the building to melt the frost on the coil. Now, without a buffer tank, or if you had a very low mass system without a buffer tank, you, you might feel that effect. But typically with floor heating or a system with a buffer tank, there's enough energy in the thermal mass of the, of the balance of system that you don't feel that. And you know that's a good marketing point, quite honestly, against uh, uh, ductless units. When they go into defrost, they have to basically cool the air in a room. That's the only source of heat there that's available to them. There is no thermal mass in the in a system. 
or there's very little, I should say. So instead of having a, uh, a you know, a few minutes of cool air blowing, you know, on a, on a cold winter night, uh, a hydronic system has enough thermal mass in it that you, you, it, it does, they all have to do defrost. It's a matter of will the customer feel that effect. And right. my experience has been no, it, you don't feel it. Very good. Uh, Ted says that I've seen two pipe buffer tank piped incorrectly that is piped straight through rather than teeing off. Can you please comment? Yeah, we, I think we've written about different buffer tank piping in uh, HPAC. I, I can't remember just what month or year it was, but there's basically two, three, and four pipe configurations, and they can all work. I tend to like the three pipe configuration with heat pumps. It does give you the ability to go directly from the heat pump to the load when, when those flow rates are, are similar and when the load and the heat pump are on at the same time. And the, the balance of the energy is going into the, uh, the buffer tank. Um, and a four pipe configuration can work as well. Um, you know, the ultimate buffer tank, I, I don't think we've seen the ultimate buffer tank on the market yet. I think it's a matter of, uh, probably some more research on what is optimal. Uh, we are seeing some buffer tanks that have heating elements built into them that would act as a, um, a backup heat source to a heat pump. So that, you know, that would preclude the need for a boiler. Uh, the other option would be to put an electric boiler in parallel with the uh, heat pump. And we've done systems like that and they work well, a two-stage control where the heat pump is on first stage and then if the heat pump's unable to maintain some temperature requirement, then the, uh, the second stage would come on, the, the electric boiler would come on. Okay, um, here I got, I, these are the last two comments and then we're gonna have to go. Um, sure. Ted mentions that radiant floor is good for greenhouses, exclamation mark. So that's uh, a market that uh, we shouldn't sleep on. Okay. And, and then William asks, and I don't know, John, if you can answer this one. When will the USA convert to metric? <laughs> I, I wish it was when I was back in college and I was told when within about three years, we're going to be all in metric. Okay. I like the metric system a lot. It, it is a more logical system for sure. I don't think I'm going to live long enough to see the U.S. converted to metric units, to be honest with you. Um, okay. Academic, yes, if you pick up any textbook in engineering today it, in the US, it's going to be in metric units, but the heating industry, um, both in the US and to, to, you know, in Canada, it's kind of a mixture. You, you've got BTS per hour and you've got Celsius. Yeah. Um, and you've got liters, you know, we have gallons. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I support the metric system, but uh, boy, I think that maybe it's going to take another generation to see that happen in the U.S. Yeah, no, I think you're right. All right, with that, I'm going to thank you, John, for participating in today's 30 Mechanical Minutes webinar. Again, I want to thank our uh, sponsor for today's 30 Mechanical Minutes, and that was AirMac. Uh, for more information, check out their website at airmac.us. That's A-E-R-M-E-C dot U-S. And of course. Thank you to um, everyone who joined us here today uh, for this edition of 30 Mechanical Minutes. Um, that's it. Bye for now. Thank you, everybody.